everyone. In today's video, we're going to go over what you need to do to prepare a drilled shaft for cross hole sonic log testing or CSL testing. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you've subscribed or checked out other videos, welcome back. My name is Casey Jones. I'm the technical director for foundation testing and consulting. We perform the majority of construction phase drill shaft testing for bridge projects as well as PDA testing for pile supported bridges throughout the central Midwest. So this video applies whether you're a contractor or your owner's representative overseeing what's going on at the construction site in preparation of the CSL test. I'll also show you what the overall process is for our CSL data collection in the field and what you can expect relative to the process for reporting the results. Okay, one of the first key topics I wanna to cover is how many CSL access tubes do you actually need? Well, by definition, since it's cross hole, you need a minimum of two CSL access tubes. That would cover something on the order of say, a reinforcing cage that was only around 30 inches in diameter. Uh, if you were going to look at a 36 inch diameter cage, something like three access tubes would be plenty. And then it goes up from there. There's an old rule of thumb that says you need to take the shaft diameter in feet and that's how many access tubes you would need. So if you had a 10 foot diameter shaft, you would need 10 tubes. However, what we find is once you get to eight tubes for an eight plus foot diameter shaft, that's plenty. That's 28 maximum possible CSL survey combinations. When you add more and more access pipes, you just uh, get sort of more or less redundant coverage. And there's some trade-offs between collecting all that extra data and is it really meaningful? Is it really useful? So again, I, I've done a lot of CSL for 12, 13 foot diameter shafts and eight tubes were plenty. Now there are some states like the state of Iowa for their bridge projects they specify a minimum of four CSL access tubes per shaft. And I've tested shafts that had reinforcing cages that were only 30 inches in diameter in Iowa and four tubes is too many. What happens is when you cram too many tubes inside a cage of given diameter and the spacing between tubes is less than 24 inches, the apparent sonic velocity or the computed sonic velocity, which is calculated by taking the horizontal spacing and divided by the time it takes for the signal to go from one tube to the next. So distance divided by time gives you velocity. And because the probes position inside the CSL tubes can vary, and these tubes are typically two inches in diameter, you might collect a data point where both probes are swinging outwards at the end of the cable and another data point just two inches upwards that where the probes are to the interior of the CSL access pipe. So that can produce well over a 10% variation in spacing which produces well over a 10% variation in apparent sonic velocity. Now, I don't see these things and say, oh, it's an anomaly. I can tell what's going on, but it's a little annoying to have a velocity plot that's just very erratic and you have to explain it in the report. So as I mentioned, once you get to a larger shaft size, say over eight foot in diameter, eight CSL tubes are plenty. But if you wanna compute the maximum number of survey combinations based on the number of CSL tubes, there's a simple formula. And let's say N is the number of CSL access tubes. So the number of combinations equal to N minus one times the quantity of N divided by two. So if you have two CSL pipes, there's two combinations, three CSL pipes, there's three combinations, four CSL pipes, there's six combinations, five CSL pipes, there's 10 maximum combinations, six CSL pipes leads to 15 survey combinations, seven, leads to 21, eight tubes gives you 28 maximum combinations, nine tubes gives you 36, and 10 tubes gives you 45. Once you get above eight, like I said, that's just too many combinations. You get quite excellent coverage uh, once you even stop at a maximum of 28 survey combinations for eight tubes. Now, there are some states like Arkansas that once you get more than six access tubes, then you have the possibility of having fewer combinations if you only survey the perimeter and the major diagonal. So for example, with eight CSL tubes in Arkansas, they would require just the eight perimeter combinations and the four major diagonals for 12 combinations. And I don't really see the point in that because when we're in the field, we're in data collection mode. So we're ensuring that we collect good quality data, but the software used to collect the data is not the same software that's used to analyze the results. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to expect the field staff to identify in real time whether a given combination has an apparent CSL anomaly. So the idea behind the specification is you would do the minimum number of survey combinations. And if you saw an anomaly, then you would go back and, and do more combinations, which 
logistically that just doesn't make sense. So our practice is to collect the maximum number of access tube combinations. That way we've got everything that we need uh, when it's time to do the evaluation and write the report. So when you install the pipes, you wanna make sure that they extend to the bottom of the shaft. And when I say bottom, I mean within one to three inches. You don't want the CSL pipes to rest on the bottom because you could have soil or rock material that this places from the side of the rock socket and ends up right next to the CSL access tube, but it doesn't represent a true condition within the concrete. So for that reason, most specifications will allow you to, and even direct you to hold the CSL access tubes a few inches off the bottom. So you'll wanna check your specification for your particular project to see what that maximum amount is. So typically you're attaching these CSL access tubes by wiring them to the inside of the reinforcing cage and typically people will attach uh, wire ties about every three feet along the length of the shaft when they're tying the access tubes to the cage. You want these CSL access tubes to extend a minimum of three feet above the top of the concrete, but there's other considerations depending on where the person collecting the CSL data will have to stand when it comes time to test the shaft. So if you're standing at grade right next to the shaft, you'll want the top of the CSL access tubes to hit between waist and chest high. And then if you have a permanent casing that extends above the top of shaft, you'll also want the CSL tubes to extend above the top of casing so that when we're pulling the cables, they're not chafing against the side of the permanent casing or even temporary casing for that matter. All right, so what type of CSL access tubes should you be using? Most specifications that I work with and based on my experience, you should use normal Schedule 40 steel access tubes with threaded couplers and threaded end caps on the top and bottom of the tubes once you perform your installation. Never use galvanized CSL pipes, never use PVC CSL pipes. Those are just gonna debond and you'll have large chunks of the survey profile that doesn't have any data. Also for the steel pipes, make sure that they don't come with a lacquer coating. And so they often put a lacquer coating on them so that no surface rust is visible. One of the telltale signs is you can see sort of like a, see a white icing type covering on the pipes. Sometimes it's very subtle. And if you see parts of the pipe that have surface rust and parts that don't, and this happens at various intervals along the vertical length of the pipe, chances are there's still remnants of the coating that is on the pipe. So if you have a coated pipe or you're not sure, I recommend that you sandblast the exterior of the pipes prior to installing them to the reinforcing cage. I've had projects where the signal was degraded to a high degree just because of the coating on these pipes. We do a lot of work in Kansas. Kansas has since required that the CSL access tubes not be coated, and if there's any doubt, they're gonna require you to sandblast them. Also, I mentioned the threaded couplers. Don't use too much pipe dope. If uh, the pipe dope squeezes out of the joint and coats the exterior of the pipe surface, that could create a zone of debonding. You don't want any foreign substance on the exterior of the pipe, whether it's machine oil, uh, soil, mud, or other foreign substances, because you want a good bond between the concrete and the steel pipe. And in fact, a little bit of surface rust, as long as it's not scale, actually helps to create a better bond between the CSL pipe and the concrete. I've done testing on uh, drilled shafts where the pipes were in the yard for many, many months, and they just had sort of a brown fuzz uh, corrosion finish and it was great. Again, as long as you don't have any loose scale, you'll be fine. Now this one may be a little controversial, but I do not recommend using the push together CSL pipes that have recently hit the market. I say recently within the last two or three years. I've had many, many projects where these pipes leaked at their joint and uh, it caused the cement paste to leach out around the joint at that location. Not enough to cause a problem with the drilled shaft, but it shows up on the CSL data. For example, here's a job where that exact scenario occurred. Uh, at first glance, it looks like a, a CSL anomaly, but you start to see that these occur at a regular interval, which corresponded to the location of the pipe joints in this, with this push together pipe. So it's, to me, I can understand the appeal. These pipes chip, typically far cheaper than the normal Schedule 40 CSL pipe. However, that cost advantage goes out the window if you have to core a shaft because of uncertain results due to a leaky pipe. All right, let's say you've got the CSL access tubes wired to the reinforcing cage. You've placed the cage in the drill shaft excavation. The next step prior to concrete placement that I recommend is that you fill the tubes with water. And the reason why is that you want generally uniform temperatures within the drill shaft 
as well as the tubes during curing. You don't want to have people come in after the shaft has achieved a 130, 140 degree temperature from the heat of hydration and then somebody puts in 60 degree water in the access tubes. That'll cause thermal contraction of the pipe and will typically cause a debonded zone between the access tube and the concrete, which degrades the quality of the CSL data. Also, if the shaft tops are exposed to freezing weather, I recommend that they be covered with curing blankets. In really cold times of the winter, I recommend filling the CSL access tubes with antifreeze, and I recommend the environmentally friendly type that people typically use for RVs, but use an approximately 50-50 mixture of the antifreeze and water to fill the CSL tubes. Obviously, if the water in the pipes is frozen at the time of testing, we're not gonna be able to collect the data and it can be a quite lengthy process to use uh, weed burners to heat up the pipes and melt the, the ice in the tubes. All right, so that covers the number of tubes, how to install them, what type of tubes you need. So typically a minimum of two days after concrete placement for the shaft, we'll wanna come out and do the CSL test, or we could do it as early as that time. Now, larger diameter shafts, we often recommend waiting as long as a week. You can't always go by the early breaks on concrete cylinders because the environment inside a drill shaft is different. You certainly don't want to have localized zones that haven't fully cured before you do the CSL test. So, uh, you know, typically uh, there's, there's specifications that we take issue with where they have a minimum of two days waiting period after concrete placement before you can test and a maximum of seven. Well, those are calendar days and if you have a weekend in between, they're pretty much dictating exactly when you have to do the CSL test, which is which is frankly silly, I think. It's usually in the best interest of the contractor and the owner to do the test in a reasonable amount of time, which I consider to be after a minimum of cure time of between two and seven days and around two to three weeks after shaft placement. That's, that's plenty of time to do the test. And again, usually the contractors are anxious to get the test result approved by the owner for the shaft so that they can move on with subsequent column construction. But to be tied in to where you have to be here either Thursday or Friday because we'll go over seven days and we have to wait at least two is counterproductive. So here's some video footage of us coming out to collect CSL data. You can see the process involves measuring the full length of each access tube, the spacing between tubes, and what the stick up distance is, that is the distance from the top of concrete to the top of the CSL tubes. Now keep in mind, I send qualified people out to collect the data. I may be collecting the data myself. I don't allow my staff to convey what they see as the results during data collection. Again, I have a different program for analysis than they have for data collection. I've done CSL testing for well over 15,000 drilled shafts in the last 22 years, and I'm the one that's uh, signing the report. So it's, it's my analysis, it's my reporting, it's really not reasonable to expect field staff to convey results, although we see that in some specifications. Uh, it's counterproductive. Before I had this epiphany to just have a procedure saying, look, we're gonna collect the data, we're gonna make sure we have good quality data, and I'll tell you verbally within 24 hours, it's often a lot sooner than that, but what the results are of the test. But don't expect my field staff, in fact, they're not allowed to. I've, I've had to part ways with staff who wouldn't follow those instructions and would give out their interpretation while they were collecting the data. And that just leads to a lot of problems. Early on, before we adopted this procedure, there might be an instance where an owner's rep is standing nearby and says, hey, well, how's it look? And somebody says, well, I think I see an anomaly here, here, and here. And before I've even seen the data, the contractor gets a phone call and says, what are you planning on doing to fix the shaft? Uh, so we don't want that. Or if let's say the person collecting the data thinks the shaft looks fine, but again, they're not looking at all the individual records and, and the way I would look at it during the analysis stage, and we find out there's some anomalies, maybe very minor ones, but let's just say the field staff says, yeah, the shaft looks fine. And before you know it, the contractor decides to proceed with grouting the pipes and cutting them off. And uh, it doesn't give me a chance to go through my quality procedure. Maybe I wanna have my staff recollect data. Maybe there's a combination that was missed, although that's we've got procedures in place so that doesn't happen. There's just no way we're gonna tell you in the field what we think the results are one way or the other. So again, while we're in the field, the goal is data collection and not data analysis and reporting. And along those lines, and I've been running into this lately, I understand usually the drill shaft test is a critical path test, but 
there's no need to hard schedule us at say be here at eight o'clock unless there's some special access considerations or we have to you know like a man lift or we have to take a boat to the drill shaft location there will be plenty of time to collect the data send it to me let me analyze it and review it before i tell you what the results are so there's the test isn't merely collecting the data the csl test is collecting the data having me review it analyze it and then report it okay so let's say we've collected the data i've reviewed the results i tell you your shaft's fine there are many states that will allow the contractor to proceed on my verbal communication of the results there are other times where they want the full report before they'll allow the contractor to go up with subsequent column construction or even to, to go out and cut the pipes off which you just have to line out ahead of time what the procedures are going to be for that particular owner so hopefully this has given you a quick overview of the data collection process and how you need to install the csl access tubes and have us collect the data and report it for your drill shaft if you have any questions, I've got my email address in the description to this video. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so and hit that notification bell. And please stay tuned for future videos. I'm posting a new video at least weekly. Thanks very much.